In this video, we're going to be building a completely wireless, battery-powered smart TV to which you can stream media from your phone with minimal fuss. As it uses a full HD IPS panel, the picture quality is pretty amazing, having exceptional viewing angles and colours. We'll also be building a high-quality soundbar for it that sounds very cinematic for its size. It's not only loud and very clear, but it actually has a touch of bass thanks to having two subwoofers built in which are hooked up to some powerful amplifiers. I believe you are destined for great things. Let's find out. Now this project is a continuation of my previous DIY guide, where we recycled an LCD panel from an old laptop and made it into an independent computer screen. It's pretty basic and features just an input board, so the first thing we'll do is add a battery system. This will attach to the back and feature a very handy LED power meter that displays how much juice is left. We'll need a few low-cost components for this, I'll be introducing these individually as we build it, and keep in mind that you can find purchasing links for every component in the description. The first thing we'll need is a plastic battery box that we'll later be populating with 10 rechargeable AA batteries. Its positive output lead can then be soldered to the middle pin of a large slide switch, which can then have a spare wire soldered onto either adjacent pin. Now we need a power socket insert, which we will be wiring up as a charging port. The other end of the spare wire we just added can be soldered to its positive tab. The remaining tab can now be connected to the negative wire from the battery box, in addition to a spare piece of black wire to follow on to the other components later. Now we can solder a piece of yellow wire to the remaining tab on the switch. This means that when the switch is on, current will flow to this new wire. When it's off, the current will flow to the charging port instead. Now it's time to add the LED power meter. These are little cheap units from China that you can buy online, and they light up depending on the voltage delivered to them, which you can calibrate using two built-in variable resistors. As we need it to be active whenever the monitor itself is turned on, we'll first remove its activation button and bridge the bottom contact point so it's on all the time. We'll now expose a small section of the spare black wire and solder it to the negative power input pad, as shown here. We can now follow it up with the yellow wire on the positive input pad. When turned on, it should light up, but you will need to calibrate it to show the remaining charge time accurately, and you can find a guide on how to do that in the description. Now we'll need two voltage regulators. These actually stabilize the voltage at a value you set regardless of whether the input voltage is higher or lower than the output voltage. So after hooking up their input pads to the yellow and black wires, we can set one to a solid 12 volts, as that's what the monitor itself requires, and the other to a solid 5 volts, for later powering the wireless video feed. We can now take two power jacks, I recycled mine from some old power adapters, and use some braided sheathing to neaten them up, not forgetting some heat shrink at the end to polish them off. They can now be hooked up to the output of the regulator that was set to 12 volts. Next we'll need a USB extension cable and chop off its socket end. This needs to be soldered to the other regulator, which of course was set to 5 volts. And with that, the circuitry is complete, and it's now ready to be mounted onto the screen itself. As you may remember from the last video, we used a piece of thin board to cover the video controller. What we need to do is replace this with one that is wider, allowing room for our extra components to be added to one side. So we can drill various mounting holes for them, and use a coping saw to cut slots for the switch and LED meter, using a file afterwards to neaten them up. The whole thing can now be wrapped in carbon fibre vinyl to match the monitor, and then all the components screwed in place. Looking cool! It can now be mounted on the back of the monitor, and one of the 12 volt jacks can be plugged into the monitor's power input. Once turned on, the panel itself should boot up. Now, you might be wondering how long this is going to last on batteries, and it's actually pretty decent, as mine lasted for about two hours. So with that done, it's time to work on perhaps the most interesting part of this build, the soundbar. This actually went through quite a few design prototypes, which did delay this video by a couple of weeks, but I think that was worth it as it really does sound fantastic. Yeah. 
the enclosure itself can be made out of MDF. I have access to a CNC router, so I designed mine in Inkscape and had it cut out for me. As most of you perhaps won't have this option, it's perfectly possible to do it by hand as well, though it probably won't look quite as nice. Once these pieces are glued together, it should be very solid. As you can see, there is a large chamber for the subwoofer and a small one for the full range driver. There's also a slot along the front for a port, which boosts the bass for a bigger sound, which we'll be tuning later. We now need two small speaker drivers for each side, so four in total. I got mine from an old laptop, but there are hundreds of various drivers available on eBay for you to choose from, a link to which you can find in the description. When I was testing these, I found that one was better at mid-tones and treble, and the other to be better at bass, so the treble one was glued into the smaller chamber, and the bass one into the larger. To power these drivers, we'll need some mono amplifiers, one for each driver. The power input and audio input pads are marked on the bottom, as are the ground connections. So the first thing to do is solder an audio cable to the audio input, and some power wires to the power input. The amplifier's output can also have a wire soldered to it. Now although these are small, the heatsink is a bit too tall to fit inside the enclosure, so we can bend it backwards to lay it down a little. Only do this once though, as repetitive bending will likely break it off. Now this first amp can be hooked up to the mid-range and treble driver, and the same process can be repeated for the bass driver, but this time a 68 ohm resistor needs to be soldered to the input with a 10 microfarad capacitor bridging it to the ground. This creates a low pass filter, which basically means that only the lower frequency tones are passed through to the amp and get amplified. The audio input wire can now be soldered to the ground like last time, but the signal wire needs to go through the resistor like so. After hooking it up to the bass driver, we can get a little audio jack from an old pair of headphones, thread it through a hole in the bottom of the enclosure, and then solder one channel up to both amps. Once the amps are added for the other side and channel in exactly the same way, we can get another power socket, and after inserting it into the enclosure, we can solder the power wires to it. So the last thing to do is tune up the ports. This can be done by gluing a piece of wood over the port at the whole end. Its length depends on the sound characteristics you're after. If you're after deeper bass, a longer port is required. But if you're after louder bass, a shorter one would be a better choice. Do a few tests yourself to see what works best for your particular setup. Once these have been glued in place, we can add a bead of glue around the edges, to fill in the gaps mostly, and then seal the whole enclosure with a back panel, which can be screwed down to clamp it in place whilst the glue dries. In the meantime, we can work on the front facade. This is simply a piece of thin board with some holes cut out for the drivers, and as you can see, it's been covered in some vinyl wrap. We'll now use a pen to ink in the visible MDF, after which we need some thin black fabric which can be cut down and glued in place on the inside surfaces. Once done it can be glued to the front over the speakers like so. Now we can wrap the rest of the enclosure in vinyl wrap, cutting off any excess with a craft knife. To mount it onto the screen, it's simply a case of screwing it to the back, which if you remember from the previous video, is actually a 6mm MDF board. It goes without saying that you do of course need to use some short screws, so that there's no chance of you screwing into the LCD screen itself, which would cause some damage to say the least. The last thing to do is plug the audio jack into the video controller's headphone socket. This socket streams audio given to it through the HDMI cable, so it will work just like a TV. Now speaking of HDMI, the way we're going to stream the video to this thing is by using a Chromecast. This can simply be plugged into the HDMI port and powered from that USB socket we added earlier. Now after plugging in the remaining 12 volt power jack into the sound bar, the whole thing can be powered on. Now once the Chromecast is powered up, we can now push media wirelessly to the screen. It not only looks fantastic thanks to the full HD IPS panel, but it sounds awesome too. So what about charging this thing? Well, for this we'll need a little multi-charger. These are designed to charge up to 10 AA batteries in series, so it's simply a case of plugging it into the charging port and off it goes. This particular charger automatically stops when the batteries are full, and you can find a link to it in the description.
Another thing you might want to check out is the handy third arm that I used when doing the soldering in this video. It was sent to me by the chaps over at Hobby Creek, to whom I send my thanks, and you can find a link below. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. It was a bit delayed in coming, so I hope you found it worth the wait. If you want to see how the screen itself was built, you can check it out by clicking the link on screen, if you've not seen it already. Other than that, I'm Matt, and I hope I see you next time.